In this video, we're going to talk about flow cytometry. So to start, I just want to highlight that flow cytometry is an extremely powerful tool and a very high throughput way to measure expression of multiple defined proteins. I say defined because for flow cytometry, you have to know what proteins you want to look at. It's not like a proteomic screen or a mass spec where you just identify every protein. So it is the proteins that you know about, but it can be many of them. And it does allow you to see them at the single cell level. So it generates plots where you can look at the single cell level at multiple proteins and see what every cell is expressing. And it can also actually be used to sort cells based on expression. So this is a very popular and powerful technique, especially used in immunology labs. But today we're just gonna talk about the basics. A lot of this technique requires you to be trained on your own lab's machines or on your own core's machines. So we're just gonna talk about the general concept and the basic idea behind it. So the way this works is that there are these very expensive machines that allow you to run your sample through and generate basically with a laser being pointed at the sample, generate a measure of fluorescence and also generate a measure of scatter, which is basically a measure of size based on how much light your particle scatters. You can use the same or similar technology to also deflect and therefore sort your cells. But we're really going to focus more on this, which is where you measure, but you can use the measurements to then spit out a sort as well. So let's start with cell preparation. So there are two ways that you might prepare your cells for flow cytometry. One is that your cells might already be modified. So you might have transfected them or transduced them to affect to express some sort of fluorophore, maybe a GFP or an RFP construct. And so some of your cells might be green and some might not be. And then you're gonna detach them from the plates and make a single cell solution that you put into flax tubes or flow tubes. And you take these to the core and run them through the machine. And this will allow you to measure what percent of your cells are expressing whatever fluorophore you are interested in. And you can do this alongside certain staining. So you can say, you know, how many of my cells are expressing GFP and how many of them also express notch one or something like that. You can also do it by staining the cells. And so this is just like immunofluorescence where you stain with primary and secondary antibodies. All of the same rules apply. You cannot have overlaps in color or in species because you have all the same problems if you do that. So it's very important to be very, very careful about that overlap. But assuming that you have no overlap, you can do your flow cytometry and get really, really cool results. So with flow cytometry, it's much more common to use conjugated antibodies where the primary has the fluorophore on it. But you can still also do the secondary antibody thing where you do a primary with a non-conjugated and then add in a secondary that's conjugated. And then once you've done this staining, you again transfer it to tubes and take it to the machine to run and read the results. So I just wanna highlight some key differences between immunofluorescence and FACS, because at this point you might be wondering if I'm just staining the cells and what is the point of doing this flow cytometry thing? So one key difference is that you can do many, many more samples at the same time. So staining is usually done in a 96 well V bottom plate, which allows you to constantly spin the cells down and then stain them with whatever solution you're interested in. So we do with this, we can do 96 X samples, obviously including the appropriate controls and triplicates and all of that. And it provides a quantitative analysis. So to make flow cytometry quantitative is very easy. But to make IF quantitative, you have to go through and look at every single picture and then count them. And even that is very subject to bias. So this is a much more unbiased, clearly quantitative way to measure expression and cell staining. It also allows far more multiplexing because most flow cytometers can read many, many more dyes in the standard microscope. 
So you're likely to be in the situation where your microscope can only read four or five colors at once, but your flow cytometer can see maybe 20 at once. So, you know, maybe you have an amazing microscope and maybe this isn't a problem, but for a lot of labs, flow cytometry offers the ability to multiplex many, many more colors together and also offers the ability to do it quantitatively and see at the single cell level what every single cell is expressing and what percent of every, every population is expressing these things. So it's a lot more powerful than a simple IF. But you do lose the localization information. So IF does allow you to clearly see which cellular compartment contains different things, and flow cytometry will not provide that information. So here we're going to go over the simplest version of the protocol. So the simplest flow cytometry you can do is a surface staining with conjugated antibodies. Of course, even simpler than this would be if your cells were simply expressing a fluorophore and you took them and ran them through the flow cytometer, but that requires no protocol at all. So we're going to focus on this one. And for this, there are variations. So if you want intracellular staining, or if you don't have conjugated antibodies, then there are variations on this protocol. But we're just gonna talk about the simplest version for now, just to give some idea. So you start by collecting your cells. So let's say that you have seeded cells, you've done certain treatments, and you're ready to run them through the flow cytometer. You're going to trypsinize them and collect them, and you're gonna put them into your 96 well plate. And in your plate design, you need to make sure to include unstained controls. That should always be the top row. So these are non-treated cells that are just not stained with anything, any antibody, and they are going to be the control for the machine. If you're going to do multiple stains together, you should also include single stain controls. So these are gonna have each antibody separately in each well. And then you include all of your experimental conditions with all the different stainings together. You're gonna wash the cells with PBS, and then you're gonna spin them down, and then you're gonna dump any excess PBS and do it again. You usually do this two to three times. So be very, very careful to only dump after you spin your cells. Spinning the cells will create a pellet at the bottom of that V bottom plate, and the cells will hold there as long as you don't dump too aggressively. But if you dump before you spin, you're just going to lose all your cells and there's going to be no flow cytometry. So be very careful about that. You're then gonna stain. So in this case, we're doing a surface staining. So we don't need to fix or permeabilize the cells because we just wanna see what's on top of them. And since we're doing a conjugated antibody, we only need one incubation because this is a primary that has the fluorophore on it. So it's one incubation of 30 minutes at room temp and the antibody is diluted in fax buffer. And then you again follow this with PBS washes. And then finally, to read it out, you will put the cells in flow cytometry tubes. So you just resuspend in about 80 of fax buffer and transfer it to a flow cytometry tube. And then you bring that over to your core or to your machine. And this is the part where it gets machine specific. So every machine is different. These are very expensive machines and you would definitely wanna get trained by someone who knows exactly how your machine works. But there are some things that are the same. So there are a few specific graphs that you must generate. And so we will talk about those in the next slides. So essentially when you go to do a flow cytometry and you run your cells through a machine, what you're gonna generate is this kind of plot. So you're gonna tell it that I want you to plot this on the x-axis and this on the y-axis. This is something that you put in. And then it's going to put every single cell in your sample as a dot on that plot. So every dot here is a cell. And you will see where the cells are clustering or where, where they tend to be on your plot. And based on that, you're going to draw what's called gates. And gates basically represent cells that you want to include or cells that you think are positive or cells that you just wanna label as a group for a certain thing, right? So I might say every cell I label within this A is a live cell, or maybe every cell I label here is positive for FL1, and so none of these cells are positive for FL1. And so the only way you can draw correct gates 
is to have the appropriate unstained populations, right? Because if I want to say that these are the cells that would be positive for FL1, then to draw this gate, I have to run cells that I know do not have any FL1 staining, and I have to see where they land. And then I have to draw my gate to be everything above or outside of that staining. So think about that and make sure it makes sense to you. But this is an unstained population that tells me that, okay, all of my cells are landing here. So this clearly is just background. This is not real staining. So anything above this is going to be considered positive for FL1. And that makes your unstained population key. Without an unstained population that you can show that decided your gating strategy, your fax is basically worthless. And then in addition to that, you of course have to have your normal experimental controls. So like if you treated the cells, you have to have a control for your treatment. Or if you did a time course, you have to have your control for your time course. And that's your control that you're going to graph and you're going to show like, you know, the treatment changed the percent expression by this amount compared to control. But the unstained control is what allows you to draw the proper gates. And then once you've done this gating, then you can sort of look at populations and say, okay, within my FL1 positive population, how many cells were also positive for CD133 or something like that. So doing this gating allows you to isolate specific populations you might be interested in. And then within those populations, you can sort of subset that and then go and look at other statings that you might be interested in. So it is very, very powerful to look at like within populations what's happening or within groups what's happening or to look at global expression and understand how that's changing. So here, this was our unstained and we gated, and then this is a normal sample that has been stained with FL1, and you can see how now the cells are appearing in this box, and now we have an FL1 positive population that is probably 22% of our overall cells. So you can see it gives you this quantitative measure and also kind of gives you a picture that's showing how the population is changing. I just want to highlight that gating is like a very important and key concept in flow. And so whoever trains you on the machine, make sure that you really understand how to gate for your machine and how your lab usually does it. Because it's also something that can be very easily criticized because you are drawing the gates and that's what determines what you get out of your flow. So if people don't trust your gates or don't think you drew them correctly, they're not going to trust your experiment. So there are a few gates that are very common to draw. And so the first one people usually will draw is to identify live cells. And this can be done with a viability die. So you could say, I want all the cells positive for my viability die against my unstained control. Or you can use the forward and side scatter because cells will scatter based on size and dead cells are usually a different size than live cells. So if you do it based on scatter, then you'll see sort of this shape. It's kind of like this arc shape. And it's the top of the arc that contains all of your live cells. So then you would identify your live cells by scatter. And you'd say, okay, 78% of my cells are alive. And now we can move on to the next step. Um, you can also actually use scatter to identify different populations of cells, not just live and dead. So here you've identified debris but you've also been identified granulocytes, which are typically larger compared to monocytes, compared to blasts, which are very tiny. So it can allow you to identify live cells or specific cell types, but most labs, unless you're specifically in immunology, you'll be doing it like this. So the second gate that you draw is to identify single cells within your live cells, because you wanna make sure that any stain you're looking at is on the single cell level. So there are multiple ways to gate for live cells. The strategy I showed you in the slide before is probably the most common, but this is another way to do it, where you identify based on FSC area and height. And then they've taken just this population and graphed it onto a second graph. And here they're looking at FSC area versus SSC area. And so if a cell is a single cell, then its forward scatter should be the same as its side scatter because it's round, right? It shouldn't be like double forward and single side, it should be exactly the same. So this bottom corner is the one to one ratio. And so this is the single cell. So now we're gonna gate these and isolate these and then move to the next steps where we look at actual staining. And then your third graph and every graph after that is going to be to look at an actual stain. 
So in this case, if you want to look at a single color, you'll usually do your color against your side scatter area. And so how far it is moved along here will be how high the expression is. So when you run your unstained control, you might get a population here and you would draw a gate like this. And then as you ran your actual samples that were stained, the population would move over into here and you would have a percent positive. You can also do colors like this, where it is one color in one axis and another color in another axis. And in this case, how far over it is here would be how many are CD4 positive. And here is CD8 positive. And then this area is actually both of them. So CD4 or CD8 positive together. And you can see that we have some cells that meet that criteria. But this here is our unstained control. And so this is how we were able to draw this gate that goes like this and like this. And so now if it moves up, it's CD8. If it moves sideways, it's CD4. And if it moves this way, it's both. So the unstained control is, again, very, very important. And you must run it first to correctly set the gates. And then you have to make sure that every sample is run in triplicate and that you have at least 10,000 cells per run to be able to draw some real conclusions. And your gates must remain fixed. So once you've set the gates on your unstained sample, they are not going to change. And you have to show people these pictures to show that they haven't changed and that you've kept everything the same. And that's how you can identify the populations. So now that we've talked about the basics of flow cytometry, and really what we've covered is the basics, you should always get someone to train you on your machine and make sure you really understand all the nuances. It's a complicated technique, but this hopefully is a good primer introduction to some of the key things to think about. And so now let's talk about the analysis. So for analysis, um, the software that's used is called Flojo. And it's an expensive software. It's not really offered for free, but most cores and most labs that do flow cytometry will have at least one license available that you can use. Um, and then when you use that software, just one key thing to keep in mind is that the gating is what people will criticize most of the time. And so when you show flow cytometry, you have to show that you've set the gates properly on an unstained sample and that you left them unchanged for the entire experiment. And you also want to make sure to show all the controls. So that is the unstained control and the experimental control and any other positive or negative controls you may have included. Um, and then some other just basic reminders would be make sure you have your triplicates and duplicates. Make sure they've analyzed with the right gates. Prism is still what is used to graph and do statistics. And then make sure you display your results with the controls and gating. So this is your actual graphs and images from the Flojo software as one panel. And then next to it, you should show the graphs from Prism that are the bar charts that show the percent positive of whatever gene you're interested in with the appropriate statistics. So you really need both to convince people that your data is correct. So these are just some examples that I will leave mostly for you to think about. But we'll talk about the first one. So the first question was, does TMZ treatment upregulate GBM cell expression of CD133 and CD15? And I asked this because these are common glioma stem cell markers, which is a population of cells that is thought to drive GBM, as we've talked about. And many people think that when you treat with TMZ, you upregulate these markers. And that has at this point been shown very robustly. And so I just want to show you that you can do this experiment with facts and it would allow you to see both how many cells are co-expressing both markers and exactly what percent of your overall population is upregulating these markers. So this is the data from one of our papers, and you can see here that we have the graphs as we talked about before, and we also have the actual prism graphs showing the statistics. We show both single and we show co-expression, and here you can see the different conditions we used and see how the gates are the same, but sort of our population is shifting over time. So I'll leave this to you for further examination, um, but you know, fax is a very powerful tool and hopefully I've shown you at least a little bit of how to use it in this video. So thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me or to the lab. And if you wanna see more content like this, please subscribe to our channel.